I pray you be with us as we study your word, as we talk about parting of the Red Sea, Father, I ask that um, we would just learn more about you. We would learn more about each other as we conversate. So be with our conversation, might be glorifying to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're back. We've missed last week because Mother's Day, the week before that because of Branson, and maybe the week before that. I don't know. It's been a while. So um, I don't want to do too much recap, though, because we've got a lot of stuff to talk about. But we are talking about Moses, and he has, through God, freed the Israelites, and now they're walking. And remember, they're going to the promised land, but if Egypt's here and the promised land is here, they're going south. And God said, well, it's because you guys don't have a military yet. You've been a country for a week. And so you're not ready for all that warfare of all the Canaanite people that you're going to be walking through. And, of course, we're going to find out as they're in the desert and they're looking at the promised land, they're not going to feel very confident either that they have the uh, capabilities to withstand these powers. And so they start headed south. And um, the interesting part is what we'll, what we'll read about this evening is that if Egypt's here, the Red Sea and the thing called the uh, I, want, I always want to say Suez Canal, but that's a new thing. Uh, that, that connects Egypt and all those places to the Mediterranean Sea. But the Gulf of Suez is the, one of the north branches of the Red Sea. And so it goes up here, Egypt's here, and Israel starts going down here. Now the problem is that they need to go up to get to the Promised Land. they got to cross the Red Sea. We're going to find out that um, they're actually being led into a trap on purpose by God. So, Moses is taking them. There's probably about 2 million Israelites that are in this herd um, following outside of Egypt. And they run into a problem. Uh, now we find in verse 1 that they are got the sea on one side and mountains surrounding the other, and the only way they could go is back. What chapter? 14. Okay. Chapter 14, Exodus 14. Sorry. So, verse 1 of Exodus chapter 14 Sorry, you guys could tell me. It's like, we don't know where. <laughs> we don't want to see if we can figure it out. That'd be impressive. Okay. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pi Hahirath, between Migdol and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. Basically, he's telling them, you're going to sit and camp. Now, Israel might be a little concerned about this because they're supposed to be running from Egypt, right? They have left. They're, they're on the run. Now, at this point, they don't suspect that Pharaoh is going to chase them, which we know that he will. But granted, they're trying to get to the promised land. And when he says set up camp, this isn't like an overnight thing. He's like, you guys are going to stay here for a little bit. And they're looking around and they're thinking, where is here, right? This is uh, a bunch of little villages around, but this isn't the promised land. I don't see any milk or honey flowing, right? And so uh, he tells them, you're going to camp, and they're trapped. They got, they're surrounded by mountains and the, and the sea. And then he says, this is the reason. For Pharaoh will save the people of Israel. They are wandering in the land. The wilderness had shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart. He will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. So God says, I'm going to make you camp in the most vulnerable spot. And I am not going to change Pharaoh's heart so that he is going to again change his mind and come after you. And you guys are going to have nowhere to go. And I'm going to get glory. That's all he says. I will receive glory when this happens. And so he's moved them. Remember, by day they're following a cloud. By night they're following a pillar of fire. And so God is leading them. Israel's not doing anything wrong. This is God's plan. He's purposely leading them into a trap. Now we obviously know why he's going to do something miraculous, but do you think that God still does that to us today? Moves us into situations where there's no way out? I do. I think he does. Yeah. I think he does. I think he puts us in situations where the only way out is to ask him to help us. Um, 
and that stinks because those situations aren't any fun. Um, but it helps us trust in him. And whenever God is the only reason that we get out of a situation, um, normally that results in only God getting the glory, right? If we couldn't do it ourselves or if no one else could help us, but we somehow get out of it by the grace of God, then God gets the glory. So I think often he puts us in places where we're just going to have to trust him. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go, but Lord, you got the reins, so you just take control, and that's what Israel did. Um, that they're going to trust the Lord in this, even though they're in the middle of nowhere. Now, I think about Moses in this situation. Now, they're not too sure where they're at, right? But Moses has already been accused of not being a great leader by Israel. Remember, he went to Egypt, and he speaks on behalf of Israel to Pharaoh, and he just makes things worse. And he cries out to God, and he's like, why? This isn't working. Oh, my gosh. And he's going to be stressful, you know? I'm trying to lead a, a, a family of five, and he's got two million people that he's having to lead in the middle of nowhere. It's got to be a little bit stressful. And so Moses is, is, you know, he's probably got his staff, and he's walking out in front of this two million people following this cloud, and he's looking around. He's like, mm-hmm. I don't know that we're going the right way. <laughs> like when I took a wrong turn on the way back from Branch and Janice is like, mm, no, no way, this isn't right, no. Or when I didn't take the right turn and we ended up in the wrong state on the way to Branson. <laughs> Granted, it was only two miles out of the way. <laughs> but we, we hit Arkansas and we were like, oh, Branson's not in Arkansas. Not this time. <laughs> <laughs> um. Have you ever been in that situation where you've been leading people and you really don't know where you're going? (laughs) I want to hear a story or two. Anything that pops up to your mind? Well, we were on the way to Branson and I had my um, Garmin. And I was listening to that, but we got really lost. <laughs> Larry called and said, where are you? I said, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, when you come to a sign, call me, and then I'll tell you where to go. <laughs> we took our college students to Atlanta for a conference, and Garrett was driving the bus, and so Garrett and this other guy went to get the bus, And they said, hey, do you guys know how to get back to where we're going to meet you? And this guy in our group was like, yep, got it. And I was like, good, because I don't, so we're going to be following you. We were in the Georgia Dome. We walked around for two hours in the Georgia Dome and could not find them. And I was finally like, everybody, sit your butts down and do not move. They are dropping us a pin, and we are going to follow it. But this guy was so confident. He was like, I got it. And I was like, okay, good, because I don't. And then he led us around the Georgia Dome. For two hours. You can only act confident for so long before yeah. people start. Then you're like, mm, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure he knows where he's going. Two hours. And I was like, I, I asked him several times, are you sure you know what you're... Yeah, 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 I got it. <laughs> and if you take not. the wrong turn in there, you end up in the... What's uh, the Coke building. Yeah, well, we just circled they're conjo- for a while. Together. And I was like, somebody send me a pin. Everybody stop. They're going to come to us and take us to them. <laughs> You know, I, I can imagine being in Moses' shoes here. Well, first of all, he's not supposed to know where he's going. He's just following the cloud, but he is the leader. And, you know, that would be difficult. He's got to keep everybody in positive spirits and keep them going. <laughs> when I went, you know, they were walking around for two hours. And when I finally found them, and, of course, where we were at, there was like, I went up like four escalators to get to where they were. They weren't even on the ground. <laughs> Lost. And I, people lost. And I look in on that. It's midnight. It was an awful experience. And everybody's face is just dread. They're just, I'm like, oh no. I was the adult leader, and you know how positive a person I am. So it was very stressful. It's a stressful situation, I'm sure. Turning on each other. We had twin brothers about to throw down in the middle of Atlanta. <laughs> um, and Moses was probably stressed too. But to add to that um, hostility, in verse 5, we see when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed towards the people. And they said, what is this that we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him. 
He took 600 chosen chariots and all of the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And so Pharaoh hears word that Israel has camped in a place where they can't escape. And that makes him change his mind. He says, well, let's go get them. Now, how quickly he forgot what it was like whenever he wasn't letting them go, right? I mean, this is only like a week. You think he would have the common sense to say, no, I'm, we're done with them. But no, he is still so consumed. And he's like, what do we do? Why do we let all of our slaves go? And so they decide to go after him. And he throws the whole kitchen sink, every single chariot they have. Now, this is going to be intimidating for Israel because guess what Israel has to defend themselves? Nothing. <laughs> They've got the clothes on their back. They've got some bread. And, and maybe someone picked up a rock along the way, but that's about it, okay? And Egypt is coming with everything. And the Lord, this is verse 8, hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. So at this point, they're, until they hear that Pharaoh's coming, now remember, they're about at least a few days, probably a week ahead of them. So there's not like a, you know, a Channel 8 news where you look on and you say, oh, Israel or Egypt decided to come get us. So, you know, they're still somewhat positive in their walk. Uh, they're defiant. They're, they're eager. They're passionate about this walk. Um, but Egypt is gaining on them quickly, right? Because the Israelites don't have horses. They don't have camels. They're just walking. And they probably have kids, Boy kids are slow. Did you know that? <laughs> I would hate, I wouldn't, anyway, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> kids are slow. And so they gain on them quickly. All of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army and overtook them encamped at the sea. So they overtake them, they catch up to them, and they surround them um, where they can't get out. They have nowhere to go. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel eyes lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. The people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? And so, you know, <laughs> a bunch of drama queens. I mean, yes, it's, it's not a good situation, and they're obviously scared. But, you know, remember that there's no more graves left in Egypt because the plagues filled up all the pyramids and all the places of burial. So they're like, oh, we get it. So you just wanted us to die out here so that we can make new graves because there was no more left. And, you know, just, just the backhandedness yeah. and the um, condescension that they had toward Moses, or they cried out, uh, yeah, to Moses. What have you done in bringing us out? Is this not what we told you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians that to die than to die in the wilderness. And so one week into their freedom, they want to go back to what they claimed was, I mean, their life was awful. They were oppressed. They were spoken against. They, they, they had no freedom. They barely had food. They were overworked. But yet, at the slightest sign of trouble, they revert back to um, where they felt comfortable. They were slaves, but they were comfortable. They felt safe. They knew what was, going, what was happening in their daily lives. They yeah. knew they, this way they don't know. I mean, when they were out. Change is scary. Yeah. It and is. No matter how bad things are, yeah, like she said, you know what's happening. You know what to kind of expect, and then... You make this leap, this jump, and you don't know what's ahead of you. Yeah. Walk in the dark. Yeah, you think about, you know, how they fear for their lives at this point. And they're afraid that they might die. And they think maybe freedom wasn't worth this. It really makes me, I, I would not want to be there, but I would love... To like maybe when we're on the new heaven and new earth and we're able to go back in time, I would love to just watch those first colonizers from um, England come to America and settle. And, and of course, I guess the first one was, was that that was Jamestown, right? That no, what was the one that disappeared? Roanoke, Roanoke colony of Roanoke, the first colony over there, and they just disappeared off the face of the planet. Wouldn't want to be them, but uh, 
you know, that idea of you want freedom so badly, the freedom to obey God and the freedom to follow him um, that you're willing to, to risk your life for. And obviously Israel wasn't there yet. They weren't ready to give up even a life of slavery for this freedom because, like you said, change is scary. And, and freedom can be, I guess, daunting. What, what do we do? I mean, we've been enslaved for over 400 years. We don't know how to do this. <laughs> We've been over our head. We need to go back. I've been there too where I've wanted to go out on some adventure and I step five feet outside my porch and I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> I don't know how to camp. <laughs> I'm awful at starting fires, aren't I? Can't start one to save my life. Matches. <laughs> didn't help that it was a fresh rain out of the wood was, that we yeah, had was wet. <laughs> chili that does nice <laughs> out of can. It was delicious. See, so I don't camp in a tent. I camp in a camper. We had Trust one, one moment where we thought we were young. <laughs> Boy, it was cheap, though. Yeah. yeah. Like 20 bucks a night. We were young and poor, so we went camping. So, uh, yeah, I think there's a natural tendency to when you kind of go out into something new and you face adversity, um, it can be very easy to be like, oh, I've made the wrong decision. I need to go back home. Um, and, uh, you know, this was what Israel was doing. And they're afraid. They're like, at least in, in Egypt we were alive. But they forgot the promise that God said, no, no, you don't get, you are going to be in the promised land. You guys are going to be free. I'm going to make sure. Now, again, things will change, right, when they're in the desert. They don't actually get to go to the promised land. Their kids do. But uh, in this time, he, he said, I will protect you. Do not fear. I'm here. I'm with you. And it's not like they can make a wrong turn. There's a giant cloud that's leading their way and a giant pillar of fire, right? They're where they're supposed to be. But still yet, they're scared. And I would be too. You have nothing and you see 600 chariots um, storming at you with people with spears and, sh and shields. And you've got pebbles. Yeah, but I don't know. The pillar of fire that I'm following seems pretty unique. You I think mean, that'd be enough? I think that'd be like, well, he did make this happen. Yeah. <laughs> but isn't it interesting, too, how God can do all these wonderful things in our life and that the first time something goes wrong, we start to doubt? Mm -hmm. I hate that about myself. He can do all, bless me in all these ways, do all these wonderful things, and then, you know, one day something doesn't work out for me, and I'm like, God, am I really supposed to be here? Am I really supposed to be doing this? I'm like, what am I talking about? Of course I am. And Moses said to them, verse 13, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you, you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Boy, there's so many situations in my life where things will work out the best if I would just shut my mouth. <laughs> that's the most help I could possibly be is to just <laughs> shut up. And that's what Moses told them. He's like, God's going to do all this. Just calm down and be quiet. Because you can think too, you know, there's probably people in Israel that were confident still, but when you start seeing people freak out and get upset and scared, it kind of creates an environment of that too. And Moses is like, look, you're, you're, you're hurting the whole congregation here. If you guys would just sit down, calm down, breathe. <laughs> just breathe. That's what we're working on with Genesis. She gets in her little drama fits, and she just loses control. She's like, just sit. <sighs> Seti hulks out. Really? Oh, yeah, he's like, <laughs> it's like this whole, I'm like, whoa. Just take a second yeah. breathe. I know he was in the back seat, Rory wanted to give him, give him her phone, and boy, I was like, I mean, I laugh, but I'm like, that's kind of scary. If you keep that up, then we really are sitting in military school. Somebody's got big fat. <laughs> <laughs> so Moses tells them, God's got this. He's going to get us out of this. And you can't, Moses is probably scared too. I mean, <laughs> he's the one that's responsible for these people. He's led them into a, a I don't know what you call it. It's a trap, but it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, they can't leave. And these people are coming to grab him. And he's like, crap. <laughs> this was bad. Was, How did he tell these people this? So, I mean, they don't have large speakers and they don't have all this stuff. That's a good question. You know, 
I don't know. I had a cell phone to <laughs> group call. <laughs> My assumption was what I did read was when, um, I guess it was a, about a month ago when we were talking about they were first leaving, that it was just by word of mouth. Um, he would tell someone, and then they would tell a group behind them. They would have messengers go from, yeah. So it took time, right? Uh, but they were, I mean, I can't imagine a camp of 2 million people, how big that would be, right? Um, that, that would be massive. And so, yeah, it would probably take a while. And, of course, what he says, you know, he says, just tell them to, tell them to shut up. And then, you know, a day later, it's finally getting out there. Got to be clear on the message too, right? We used to play a game in youth where you would, yeah, Yeah. you'd whisper something to somebody, you'd go around the room by the time it was like, I like baked potatoes. And then he gets the other round and it's like, Garrett's an idiot. I'm like, well, hold on. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So verse 15 says, the Lord said to Moses, tell the people, why do you cry to me? You are to go forward, lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots, his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. So again, remember, this is all about one God displaying his glory to a Pharaoh who said, what God is going to take you from me? Who is this God that you speak on behalf, right? And God said, I'll show you who I am. He's doing that to to Egypt. And then also, this is all purpose to help Israel trust God. He's going to do all of these things so that Israel would know that he's God and they can put their faith in him. Um, Unfortunately, they just forget to tell the stories of what God did for them um, to the next generation, and and they forget. But um, as of right now, he says, you're going to roll your hand out over the sea. Have they done, Janice, you might know, have they ever done Moses at that play in Branson? I think they have. Yeah, I was going to say, I thought I'd heard more. That would be really interesting to see this scene. Boy, I, I had no idea how they were going to do the Jesus walking on water scene, and it was incredible. I don't know how they made that look so real, but they did. It was it one of the, We've seen various situations that you just, it's amazing mm-hmm. what they do. I was blown away. Sorry, I thought that conversation was going to last. <laughs> Cover me up here. Got one more bite. Okay. <clears throat> so he says, divide it. You know, of course, you know, you, you're, you, God tells Moses to do this. If I'm Moses, I'm like, you want me to what? You want me to divide the sea? What are you talking about? Um, so that Israel may go through, and once they go through, we're going to cover it back up, and it's going to kill all of Egypt, and then Pharaoh will definitely know who I am, right? And so uh, it says in verse 19, Then the angel of God who was going before the host of Israel moved and went behind them, and a pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. So the same pillar, the same cloud that was leading them now goes behind them to protect them until they get across the sea. That is. You know, I don't even think that pillar of cloud really needed to do too much. If I was an Egyptian and I saw that thing, I'd be like, I'm just going to stay away from that. Because um, remember, at this point, Egypt was camped in around them, so they could have been intermixed with Israel as they're walking through the Red Sea, right? Uh, but no, God's going to hold Israel back. You good? Okay. God's going to hold Egypt back so that Israel gets through first. Um And it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Verse 21, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. You think Ames had strong winds. (laughs) You see one that would divide an entire sea, right? People probably lost their tents. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on the right and to the left. Isn't that amazing? 
and I, I did some research, and, and so the numbers here are going to be um, smaller than what they actually were because thousands of years ago, um, there was more water, right? The erosion causes things to, to go different. I guess it wouldn't be as deep. But anyway, uh, I, I did some research, and it said that the average depth of the Gulf of Suez was about 120 feet. And so most likely, we're looking at at least 120 feet tall walls of water on each side of them. Now, I would be terrified because I've been in the bottom of a 10-foot pool and my head starts to hurt, right? Because of the pressure. I couldn't imagine it, thinking that what if that 120 feet of water just... And, and, and I'm guessing you're seeing like fish swimming around. Like, do you, do you, do you, <laughs> do you go by the side and kind of graze the the walls of water as you're walking, or do you stay in the center and <laughs> sprint, right? Um, but about 120 feet deep, and it says the max, um, I want to get my numbers right here. The max, uh, oh, come on, I had it. But to make it wide enough for all these millions of people, yeah, it's, so they, they went across, of course, the Suez Canal runs this way, right? And they're crossing it this way. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if it'd be really, really wide so that they're all walking, you know, kind of yeah. in the same, or if they've got a long line that they're walking through. Yeah. I think most pictures of it have the long lines that are walking through a more thin. But even that would take for two million people to be a long time. Well, and the average length or width of that is about 20 miles. And so this wasn't a instant thing, right? This took a long time to walk through this. They probably had to sleep. Um, I don't know, can you walk 20? I'm sure they could walk 20 miles in a day. I don't think I'm gonna be sleeping like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> be like, oh, you, all, you all tell you, I'm, I'm running. I'm out of here, I'll sleep when I I'll meet you, I'll side. meet you out. <laughs> I'll meet you on drive. because the marathon is uh, 26. You think? But so, yeah. if you're walking, you can walk 20 miles. Walk 20 miles in a day. I'm yeah. Take a few hours. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they probably did it in a day. But it, I think a lot of people think it was just like, no, it was, it was, it was a trek, right? Um, and they've got all their stuff. They got all their kids. Um, if we had JoJo, she would be freaking out and crying. Um, and so it was, it was a very interesting, very interesting sight. Something that I hope that I can see one day. Um, how that worked, or you know, if we're, we're living with Christ, be like Jesus. Can you can you do that again? Can I see what that looks like? Um, and so the waters were divided. The people of Israel went into the midst on dry ground. The water being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them in the midst of the sea. All Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, his horsemen, and in the morning watch. The Lord in a pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic by clogging their chariot wheel so that they drove heavily. We're not sure exactly what this means. Um, either it got really muddy, because when it says they went on dry ground, that really wouldn't make sense unless there was also a supernatural drying, because the, the, yeah. uh, the floor of the sea would be wet, mm -hmm. right? Um, so maybe... After Israel had crossed, God made it muddy again, because if you got wheels, that's not really, you know, unless you got a four-by-four four chariot. Um, and, and, of course, horses, I assume, don't do too well in heavy mud either. And so, or do they? Am I misspeaking there? Horses. Do horses like running in mud and stuff? Well, I don't know they do like it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's probably what happened, uh, clogging their chariot wheel so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them and against the Egyptians. And so they get scared. They're in the middle of that. Now they're in the middle of the great walls. And I, it, if I am, and I remember that this is, this is Pharaoh's soldiers and people that are making this decision. I am going out and living in the middle of nowhere before I go in to that ocean. Right After all the mess that I've seen in Egypt and how I've seen God protect Israel, I feel like there's no chance in the world that I am chasing them through this area. Right, um, But maybe I would. I don't know. I wouldn't think that I would. But they choose to. But they decide in the middle of it that uh, I think we've made a mistake. 
<laughs> this wasn't a good idea. Let's go home. Um, then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come back on the Egyptians, upon their chariots, upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. Of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea. The waters being a wall to them on their right and on their left. So they all die. The, the, the walls close in on them. And um, it's about to say that they're, they, they end up on the shore. I, I think that's kind of what water does, right? After you pass away, you float to the top. And then the current kind of pushes you up on the sh shore. So you can imagine being Israel standing on one side of the sea. And, and then they look over and they see death everywhere absolute stench of it and and how i don't know how i would feel if i'm seeing those walls closing in on egypt you know as they're trying to escape that that would be horrifying i think regardless of how badly they treated me and i imagine under the pressure that they probably died instantly i would think um because you know they they talk about when you go to explore the ocean they have those special submarines that are compressed to where they said if you're at the bottom of whatever the Mariana Trench or wherever the deepest part of the ocean floor is, and if you were to get out of that submarine, your body would just pancake um, because of the pressure. It would just crush you instantly. So, so that's pretty amazing to me. And like I said, I can barely handle 10 feet in the bottom of a swimming pool, and I start getting a headache. So I can't imagine what 100, 120 feet of pressure instantly upon you does. Well, but. when you go scuba diving, they make you go down five feet at a time and stop and get adjusted to the pressure and mm. then go down five more feet. So. Yeah, I've never done that before. But I have heard that if you come up too fast, bad things can happen. Yes. Mm -hmm. I've heard that too. My kids are getting ready to go on a trip tomorrow. And they're going, on their trip, they're going to go scuba diving. Historically, not scuba. Yeah. I thought Gerald was snorkeling at one time. <laughs> close, seriously, close. I thought I, I thought I was dead. <laughs> and she was laughing. In Jamaica. <laughs> really thought I was dying. I thought I was, that was it. I told him you don't breathe in through your mouth. <laughs> Suck the water right through. <laughs> Katie's wanted to go. Have you been snorkeling? No, I've been scuba diving. Yeah, I thought. Yeah, I remember the last time we were in the ocean, I had to carry her because little fish were pecking at her legs and she couldn't <laughs> handle it. I went scuba diving when I was young, okay? <laughs> you talked me into it. Today, probably don't know if I'd go. <laughs> but no, I cut my leg and I had to come up because they said that my blood was not good in the water. So. Oh, geez. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, so they need to come up and I I've like, seen Jaws. I know what happens. Scuba trip <laughs> 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 I got sick on the boat and threw up. It was not a pleasant experience. <laughs> so verse 30, we'll finish this out. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against Egypt. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and his servant Moses. So it worked. They saw, of course, I'll think at the first miracle I would kind of be on board, but he does. God does ten miracles and the splitting of the Red Sea. I feel like you kind of have to agree that something more powerful than you is going on. And so they, they jump on board. They are believing in Moses and, and the Lord. And things are peachy. Now, obviously, very soon they're going to forget that. Why do you think it is? Kind of, kind of bringing this message, or message, I'm still in preaching mode. Uh, thinking through kind of the purpose of this chapter, why do you think it is that we so often forget what God has done for us? Because you would think that if you experienced this time being an Israelite in Egypt and seeing the plagues and seeing what God did, seeing the cloud and the pillar of fire and, and the walls of water, how could you ever forget that? You would think you never would. But why do you think today people, just like Israel is going to do, forget what God has done for them? Forget his promises? Any 
Thoughts? I think we're kind of a selfish being and in the moment when things aren't working out, it's all about us. As you don't really have space in your head to think about all the good because you're fretting over what's happening right now. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's also like a kid too. It goes back to selfishness when a kid, when you tell them not to do something, and then ten minutes later they do it, and they're like, "Oh, I mean, forgot." Because they want, yeah, something curious, they want. It's like yeah. curiosity killed the cat. <clears throat> it's. I think it's human nature, regardless of what personality you have, to be consumed by the negative and forget all the good. Um, I wish. You know, I guess you have optimists and you have pessimists, but I think even optimists struggle with dwelling just a little bit longer on the bad things that happen and, and not so much on the good. I mean, I think it's because as a human being in human nature, we expect good things to happen to us. Um, and so when good things do happen to us, I think sometimes we forget to give God glory for that and we don't recognize that he's the one that gave us that blessing. Um, but we're always quick to blame him when something bad happens, right? Um, and so I, I do the same thing. I, I dwell so often um, on the negative things in my life and the negative things that happen. And, and there's times where I'll just miss out on obvious blessings that the Lord has given me because I'm too focused on pouting. I get on the kids all the time for pouting, especially Genesis. But um, I think I'm as guilty of it as she is. You, know, you wake up in the morning, you hear bad news, and you say, well, today's ruined. Might as well just go back to sleep. It's hard to, um, I think it's hard sometimes to give God credit, not necessarily because you don't want to, but because we just don't think about it. We either um, just give credit to ourselves instantly, or we just expect, you know, things to work out for the best. Maybe we get used to God's blessings, where they become expectations. Um, I remember when we were uh, we were doing one of the kids' birthdays. And it was, we were having a big party for them all together because our families are really far off. But on their actual birthday, we weren't really going to do a whole lot other than sing happy birthday to them, let them eat what they wanted to. Well, they got very disappointed um, when there wasn't presents, right? Where are my presents? Or it was Genesis, and there wasn't a birthday cake. She wanted a birthday cake. She's like, where's my birthday cake? I'm like, girl, you got... A present, you got balloons, you got to pick what you wanted to eat for dinner, which was just cheese dip, pretty much. <laughs> um, but she had the expectation that she wanted a birthday cake, so her birthday was ruined because she didn't get what she expected. I mean, I've done the same thing, especially in Christmas or birthdays where I really expect to get a certain gift, right, when I was a kid, and, and also today, I guess. Um, <laughs> and you don't get that thing, you're like, oh, Man, I'm upset. Well, you got all this stuff piled in the corner, you know, uh, but we don't think about that. We think about the one thing that we wanted that we didn't get. Yeah, I, I think it's just human nature, and it's something that we have to battle. Thankfully, we have the Holy Spirit that helps remind us um, of who God is and what he's done for us and what he does for us. Any thoughts or questions? Any gifts you guys wanted when you were a kid and didn't get and got upset? I got a sister for a birthday. Hmm? I got a sister for a birthday. Cool. I love her. Our youngest one was born on my birthday. That's all I got was for a Game Boy. <laughs> for all the time. 12 birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> for one time. I had, I, I was so tired of not having birthday parties because my mom told me nobody would come. <laughs> His birthday's on Christmas Eve. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Okay. And, I, and I was like, Mom, Background. I want to have a birthday party. I want my friends, I want to have a birthday party on my birthday. And so finally we, we decided to have it. And I think I had two or three friends come. Um, and I got really upset and disappointed because I didn't get what I wanted. Um, but Mom was like, Parents are not going to let their <laughs> children hang out with you on Christmas morning. That's kind of a family thing. <laughs> but. That's funny. I've done that for the kids kind of party. 
and want it to be bigger. They seem to be fine with it, but then I'm disappointed. I put all that work in, and it's like, mm, I don't need to make it anymore. It was pointless. I spent too much money in it. And yeah. But they don't seem to be bothered by it. <laughs> yeah. There's a, uh, gosh, it's a, it's a tough situation when a JD's classmates, she's kind of a bully. She's really mean. She doesn't have any friends. Mm. Um, JD came home last week and she was like, sometimes Miss Tolan, their teacher, uh, will just go up and give her a hug because nobody will play with her and stuff like that. And she has a birthday this summer and her mom has sent out invitations for her birthday party like three, it's in August. No, that's a Oh, that's a different one. one. Hers was but in it, July. It was in, yeah, it was like three months in advance, and, and she was just like, she's afraid that nobody's going to come to her, you know, little girl's birthday party. It's so, so sad. But she's also apparently so, so mean. So get concerned with that. I'm like, well, he doesn't like her, but I feel like he should probably go. Yeah. Oh, wait, there's a, there's a little girl in Cash's class, and she's she's got a barrel of things. Um, and so, like I tell people all the time, I said the educated person in me totally understands the things. Um, the teacher in me gets really irritated when it disrupts everybody else and what we need to do. Um, and she's made a couple of inappropriate comments to Cash at different times. Of course, he's so easygoing. He's like, really whatever. Like, or she'll push him or whatever. And he's just like, he won't even tell on her. Um, but then the other day, she asked if he could come to her house. Which the answer to that is no. No, he cannot because based on the inappropriate comments that have been made in, in the back history. But um, I was like, why? And she said, because I want him to come over. And I was like, why? And she goes, because I want him to play with me. Mm. And of course, then I get it because she doesn't really have anybody that wants to play with her because she's all the issues. And so she's alienated herself. And so it's like, I feel bad. I'm like, hmm. And if I looked at Catherine's six and I would have played with her, he would totally do it. But he might hate me for it because... It's a lot, but it made me feel bad in that moment. It's like she just really wants a friend. Sure. All she really wants. So sure. But. Oh, well, I guess to kind of close up, you know, we we see um, that God gives Israel. Well, what we'll kind of leave with before we get into next week, uh, God gives Israel every opportunity possible to keep believing in Him and to trust in Him. He has made himself known. There is no question that he is good to fulfill his promises and protect them. Um, he's showing his glory along the way. And we're going to see at the first sign of trouble, um, all of that good stuff goes out the window. Uh, when, when again, because remember, they're free. They've seen God's power in the plagues in Egypt. And the first time they see Israel approaching them in those chariots, they forget it all. They forget the God that they serve and the power, and they just see the power of what's in front of them. And I think that's one of the harder parts, right, is because we see the struggle, what's in front of our eyes. We kind of forget that God's power is there because it's not, we don't see it. It's something we have to trust in and believe. And, uh, and that's kind of where your spiritual sense needs to take over. And how strong your spiritual sense is is how much time you spend with the Lord. And so uh, we can get stronger in that area by spending time with Him. Well, I will... Uh, I'll pray for us, and then we will get going with our week. God, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for your word. And I ask that um, we would take this lesson with Israel to heart, and we would see that just like you did in this time period, Father, you have made yourself so evidently known in our lives. Let us not forget who you are. Let us not forget the power with which you rule over us and the promises that you've given us. And regardless of the trials and temptations that might arise this week, Father, let us trust in you and not forget what you've called us to do and the promises you made to us. Please help us in the decisions we need to make and the tasks that we need to accomplish. And may it be for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks.